Good evening, everybody, and I welcome both members of the Thornbury Society and visitors to this evening's talk. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Nan Sloan, who will be known to many of you. She was a Leeds City councillor for many years. She also was director of the Centre for Women and Democracy. Her earlier book, The Women in the Room, Labour Scott Women, was published in 2018. And Stephen is just going to talk about the topic of the most recent book, Uncontrollable Women, Radicals, Reformers, and Revolutionaries. So, welcome, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, first things first, can you hear me at the back? Excellent. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It is always a pleasure to be given time to come and uh, talk about. Uh, this book in particular and about the women in it, uh, most of whom nobody has ever heard of, I think it's fair to say, um, there are obvious and good reasons for that. One of them is that they are all women who predate the suffrage movement, the female suffrage movement, and so because we view the history of women largely through that prism, we lose all the women who don't conform to our idea of what political women were about in the 19th century. Um, it covers the period between the outbreak of the French Revolution in 1789 and the Great Reform Act, which, as we will find out, is neither so great nor particularly reforming, in 1832. And uh, initially it was going to be a much longer period, but there was so much material that I had to shorten the period in order to uh, cover any of them properly. Sadly, almost none of them lived in Leeds. Um, so <laughs> what I'm going to do this evening is take three uh, sets of events from that period and uh, look at them and at the role that women had in them. Uh, and then look at a, a specific uh, woman and uh, some conundrums around her. And then lastly, as a woman who isn't in the book at all, but who I discovered in the course of um, research um, and who I think um, speaks for, in a way, the vast majority of women who were not involved in, in any of these things at all, but just lived productive lives. Um, so I'm going to start off by uh, setting, um, start off with, the, with events in 1812. Uh, 1812, so no. Um, 1812 was a very unsettled oh. year. <laughs> uh, it was a year full of social and economic change. It was in a period that um, uh, was it, during what we now call the Industrial Revolution, uh, a period when there was uh, mass migration across the country as people moved from rural communities into urban communities. The uh, population of Leeds grew from roughly 30,000 in 1800 to roughly 150,000 in 1840. And so, as you can imagine, if the population um, multiplies in that way over that short of period of time. There is not enough housing, there is not, there's no sanitation, there's no health service, there's nothing um, for people. Um, and uh, there were huge levels of exploitation and um, you know, high, high mortality rates. Children were working 12 hours a day, um, adults more. And so it was a very pressurised and difficult environment for most inhabitants of Leeds. Um, secondly, the country had been a, at war almost continuously, not quite continuously, but almost continuously at war with somebody for most of the last 20 years. In 1812, there was a lull 
in uh, um, the European War that we were still in the uh, Iberian Peninsula, but we had a war with the United States instead. So for most of this period, and indeed until Waterloo, we were at war with somebody. So we also had a country that was exhausted by the war and economically exhausted by the war. And as usual, some people did very well out of it, including cloth manufacturers. Um, but cloth workers did less well um, uh, because they were not the people making the fortunes out of um, the war. Uh, trade was often interrupted, and in particular, uh, food supplies were interrupted. There were corn laws which went back um, decades into the 18th century, which kept the price of grain artificially high. Crops failed on a regular basis. Large parts of the north of England were as dependent on potatoes as Ireland was. In 1812, the potato crop in Lancashire failed. Um, so it, it was a period when the, the, both the price of food was going up and the supply of food was going down. Consequences for us is not enough tomatoes in the supermarket. <laughs> Consequence for many people in 1812 was literally starvation. So this was something, and um, we will come back um, to this. Uh, there was endemic poverty. Uh, people say now, oh, the gap between rich and poor is never been so great. I suggest they sit down and read <laughs> what the gap was like at this and most other periods of history. Um, uh, and finally, there was massive political corruption. Uh, we, when we think about the, the pre-1832 political system, people will quote things like old serum and no voters and all that kind of thing. But the real um, shocking thing about the system was that votes were a commercial commodity and they were attached to pieces of land. The piece of land would differ from every area had its own regulations about who could and couldn't vote and what the um, threshold was for voting. But if you owned the pieces of land which had votes attached, you could sell it, you could put it in your daughter's diary. Um, uh, lots, uh, there, lots, there are certainly cases of men who married women in order to get the vote that went with the piece of land that was coming as their dowry. Um, and then there were um, people like Sophia Elizabeth, or Elizabeth Sophia, she seems to have done it both around, Lawrence and Sunny Royal, who basically owned Ripon, uh, and as the Times said, really, return, really returns the members sent from this borough to Parliament, so two MPs in Ripon, uh, she was a Tory, there were always Tory MPs in Ripon, she owned the majority of the votes in the town. And uh, one um, Whig who stood against her complained about the town being covered by one enormous blue petticoat. And you, you know, <laughs> grudgingly, you can see what he meant because um, she, uh, she had enormous control. When one of her MPs was offered the job of Chancellor of the Exchequer by the then Prime Minister, he said, he was quite keen to take it, but he would have to check back with Miss Lawrence just to make sure it was all right with her. So people who owned these votes had enormous amounts of power over the MPs that they sent to Parliament, who would therefore legislate in the interests, not of the electors who had sent them there, but of the person who owned the electors who sent them there. And this is, this is a system against which the parliamentary reform movement in the early part of the 19th century was fighting. Um, as you can see, people had quite a lot of grievances. And in 1812, this resulted in an outbreak in the north of England, mainly in the north of England, but also in other places, of Luddism. 
uh, which could take many forms, not just machine breaking, but also destruction of goods, um, uh, destruction of building. And uh, Leeds was no exception. This is uh, a poster uh, put up to offer an enormous reward. Thousand pounds in 1812 is a huge investment. Uh, and there's uh, a mill at Oakland near Leeds, now subsumed in it will have done, there would be another area. Um, uh, the more famous example of Thompson's Mill at Rawdon, um, and uh, Dickinson Carr and Co in Water Lane, uh, who were all subject to Luddite tax, who um, uh, all um, uh, wanted to put a stop to it and who all wanted to know who was responsible. However, people who were engaged in this kind of activity swore oaths of secrecy and loyalty. And it was, they were not like the mafia, but they were in that once you had sworn that oath, it was unbreakable. And so the authorities had enormous difficulty finding out who was responsible for many of these attacks. Hence the enormous reward is to try to induce somebody to break, um, to break their oaths. It, and it's worth remembering that when the top of the matters were sentenced um, uh, later, it was not actually performing the trade union, it was for swearing oaths of secrecy for which the mandatory sentence was seven years transportation. Um, uh, by and large, most of the were never caught. Uh, the main trigger for boredom being tuned in, York, in West Yorkshire in the end was not these events, but the murder of William Cartwright in Huddersfield. Uh, and even then it took months and months and months to find who had done it. So uh, this, this was a, a sustained campaign uh, and very destructive, but uh, also temporary. Most Lanites were men. Women tended not to go out at night machine breaking. It was uh, not safe or approved of. What women did was something altogether different, with, which was food riots. Yay. Um, uh, which was food riots. Women were expected to care for their families, and therefore it was generally accepted that if women uh, uh, but you use food riots in order to do that. That was in a weird way socially acceptable. Food riots were often led by somebody called Lady Ludd, sometimes a man dressed up as a woman, um, often not, often an actual woman, shock horror. Uh, Lady Ludd was more often a woman than not. And uh, she headed up what was called by the middle class press, the mob. But bizarrely, there were rules about how you conducted a food riot. And uh, these rules were there for very good reasons. If you stole food, you could be charged with theft, a capital offence. If you stole food off carts bringing it into market, you could be charged with highway robbery, a capital offence. However, if you took the food and sold it at a reduced price from what the profiteering farmers and merchants in your view were selling it for, you could, and you gave the money back to the person who owned the food, then everybody was prepared to call it quits. And so there are relatively few prosecutions as a consequence of food riots, although they happened across the North of England and in parts of the North Midlands 
and, and a few elsewhere. But there were relatively few rides. And these were not people going out in the middle of the night. These were people going out in broad daylight. Everybody knew who they were because they were your neighbours and your friends and your sisters and your sisters' kids and all the usual collection of lads who turn up, you know, whatever. There's something going on that might be more amusing than what they were doing before. Um, and yet there are very few prosecutions. In 1812, as a result of a few of the food rights, only one woman was hung in uh, uh, Lancashire, in, well, in Lancaster jail. And that was because she had not returned the money to the owner of the goods. And so she was charged with highway robbery and convicted. Three women in uh, Wakefield called uh, Betty Wood, Mary Ellis and Mary Wright were charged with highway robbery and acquitted, uh, probably because they had children and the poor woman in Lancaster did not. And so this thing about women are only acting in defense of their children tended to kick in. The other thing is that most food riots happened as prices were rising, because when prices hit the height, you were too starved to go out rioting. You didn't have the energy. So food riots tended to be an act of apprehension, an act of fear of what is what might be going to happen rather than um, a, a, an act of protest against something that had happened. And there are um, uh, plenty of examples, including Leeds. So in our corn market last Tuesday, a spirit of insubordination and tumult and was evinced by a mob of women and daring lads, which if persisted in must produce incalculable damage. You can hear the middle class respectability of a man who knows where his next meal is coming from and how he's going to feed his children. Um, Philip Arm hooted at every passenger, chatted and hazard opposite the bakers and meal seller shops. On Thursday, some potatoes were seized and Lady Lund ordered the different shopkeepers to lower their prices. So they didn't necessarily take the food, they just wanted to be able to afford it. Um, now, obviously, one of the questions that has uh, always engaged people is who was Lady Ludd? There doesn't seem to have been a suggestion that she uh, was in fact a man in, in the case in Leeds. Um, there are various suggestions as to who she might have been. Normally, she would have been a, an older woman with some authority. She had to be somebody that the uh, traders would trust to give them the money back before they handed over their food or had it taken from them. But she also had to be able to enforce that. So she had to, she had to make sure that the money did go to the places where it was supposed to go. And so she was probably a woman in, in middle age, well known, and with some uh, authority but beyond that we don't know because one of the things that bedevils history of this time is that nobody ever bothers to write women's names down so we have a lot of anonymous um, uh, women. Middle class people to be fair were very conflicted about the situation in which people found themselves um, and, and this is fairly typical it would uh, Baines, Stephen Baines Senior, because there were two of them, confusingly, uh, uh, it, it basically saying what we always hear, direct action will solve the problem that you're trying to solve. But again, I'm sure the women would have said back to him, so what will, what will you do to help us to feed our children? Um, but in, in the case of uh, men like Edward Baines, uh, he was very much prepared to sympathise with people, but he was not prepared to go to the to the point of giving them the agency to solve the problem themselves. And obviously, food riots were not the answer to a systemic problem in the foods in food supply, but they were the immediate answer to what do we eat today? What do uh, what are we going to eat tomorrow? Um, 
uh, Edward Baines considered himself and was considered a radical, um, but he uh, drew the line on a number of occasions, including, as we will uh, see when it came to universal suffrage, he didn't think that was a very good idea either, even though he supported the parliamentary reform cause. And the other major area of activity besides rioting was parliamentary reform. Um, in 1812, there was a parliamentary reform movement, which got dealt with in the usual way by rounding up and locking up all the leaders. Uh, in 1817, the government suspended Hegel's corpus and literally locked them all up for an indefinite period. Um, this being this country, it all ended up it messily in the courts, but uh, that's a different story. Um, by 1819, the reform movement had got a, however many wind it is, second and third wind, and they had decided that they were going to have a big push. The war was now over, uh, and uh, the economy was not doing well. It was in the post-war dip before it uh, took off again in the 18. Princes. And um, they, there have been diff many different um, different ideas about what the parliamentary reform movement should demand. And in 1819, they finally agreed a common platform, uh, including what universal suffrage meant. There was a big debate. Should universal suffrage mean that every head of household had a vote? or every man had a vote. And the conclusion to which they came was that every man should have a vote. So when you, from this point on, when people are talking about universal suffrage, they're talking about uh, adult manhood suffrage, not about women. There is no suggestion to get right to the end of this that women should have votes other than if they own them. So they, had large scale petitions. They got signatures. There was perhaps counterintuitively a higher level of literacy amongst working people than we now think there was. Particularly for women, literacy levels went down during the Victorian period. Uh, you know, many of you have go down rabbit holes of how Victorians treated working class women, but the uh, educational opportunities for working class women reduced. Uh, later in the century, but at this stage were quite high. Working lots of working class men could uh, either read or write or both could certainly sign their names on a petition. So there were big um, uh, petitions that were got up. The phrase monster meeting comes from this period. They organized enormous and to the authorities terrifying public meetings. Um, they were held every Monday somewhere in the north of England. Uh, Monday, because Monday was traditionally a day off. The weekend was Sunday, Monday, not Saturday, Sunday, as we now understand it. So certainly in the textile industries, lots of people had Mondays off. So Monday was a good day for your demo. Um, they were usually held just outside towns because... Uh, either towns did not have a venue big enough to hold the size of meeting or hardly enough <laughs> the owners of buildings refused to let them have <laughs> two large meetings of uh, working class men and women. Uh, there was also a network of local reform societies, again of working class men, self-organised, who connected with one another, exchanged um, experience, people knew what was going on, news traveled much faster than we think it did. Um, uh, the, the media were usually behind the curve on knowing what was going on. Um, and speakers crisscrossed the country. So it's the same speakers will turn up sometimes on the same day at different uh, meetings. And some of the speakers were uh, immensely famous and well-known, like Henry Hunt, Orator Hunt, who uh, was indefatigable. I mean, how he kept going sometimes, but he, he spoke at a huge number of meetings and vast numbers of people turned out to see him. 
uh, there were meetings in Leeds on Hunter Moor, uh, uh, attracting between 10 and 30,000 people a time. Um, no mention of women, but they were enthusiastic passers of resolutions. So meetings would pass 10 or 15 individual resolutions. They were debated, they were spoken from the platform and then passed by acclamation and uh, and, and were about the uh, reform demands. So we want universal suffrage, we want secret ballots, we want annual parliaments, we want uh, all the things that uh, uh, reform movements have been um, asking for. The Leeds Reform Society uh, met in uh, Union Court, which was just off Brigitte and I think no longer exists and is unrecognisable anyway, um, that area. There is no mention of, a, of women being members of it, but elsewhere, there were uh, springing up female reform societies, again, self-organized, and these are the first working class women's political organization formed not for the vote for themselves, but for the vote for their husbands, fathers, brothers and sons. Um, it wouldn't have crossed their minds to campaign for votes for themselves. And so shocking, was their um, entrance into political life considered that the press went to town on them. Um, I mean, anything you see on Twitter is mild <laughs> compared with what these poor women have got. Um, uh, so this is the Blackburn female reformers. And uh, what the, the role of the women at the monster meetings was at the beginning of the meeting to go onto the platform to um, present the chair with a flag with uh, a, some kind of slogan on it and a cap of liberty. And the cap of liberty was um, very um, emotive for people. It, it was the symbol of freedom and of equality it had been, uh, it go, went back to Roman times when it's uh, based on a, um, a cap given by slave owners to their slaves when they were freeing them. And so it, it had real resonance for people. It had played a part in the French Revolution, was regarded by the authorities as a revolutionary symbol. And the women uh, would make a very elaborate cap of liberty, but often very highly decorated and presented. Um, and so you can see that this character here has the flagpole with the cap on it at a, an angle, shall we say, that is suggestive of something other than what it actually is. The women are presented in trousers with their skirts tucked up. Uh, you can't see it quite so well on, on this, but they have bottles, so they're drunk obviously. Um, they have babies tucked under their arms. There is a, a man in women's clothing. There are uh, um, people, men without trousers. So the men who are associating with these women are in some way unmanned or demasculated. De um, and they're just, they're presented as hideous harridans uh, and this is quite mild compared with some of the others. Um, the Times in July 1819 reported with repugnance one novel and most disgusting scene, a deputation from the Blackburn Female Reform Society mounted the stage to present the cup of liberty and an address to the meeting. That's another thing. These women spoke and they were not supposed to do that. These women then mixed with the orators and remained on the hustings during the rest of the day. The public scarcely need be informed that these females are women well known to be amongst the most abandoned of their sex. In other words, prostitutes. Nevertheless, they persisted. Um, and uh, 
as I say, although there's no mention of one at this stage uh, in Leeds, it is likely that there were discussions about it, and there certainly uh, were reform, uh, female reform societies in Rawdon um, and Fancy, and so it's reasonable to assume there may well have been moves to set one up in Leeds. The most famous of the month's meetings and the meeting up to which all the others were to lead is, of course, oh, oops, no, don't do that, back. Oh, yeah. There's two of us doing this, so, <laughs> um, is, of course, Peter Lou. This is one of the many engravings of Peter Lou. It is not factually accurate, if only because, there were about 10 or a dozen women on the platform at the time uh, because the female uh, reformers of Manchester, of whom this woman was president, um, uh, were on the platform together with uh, uh, others from surrounding areas. But it gives uh, us the flavor and it is in a way the best representation of it. Um, this is Henry Hunt with his famous white hat, uh, trying to ward off what he sees coming. The woman with the flag is called Mary Files, um, and uh, is the only speaker, she was in the moment to be speaking, the only speaker on the platform who was not arrested during or after the event, but she went on the run although she was injured. Um, and uh, the, you can see the mayhem um, going on uh, in front. And in the book, I've uh, got a detailed description of what happened to the women uh, at Peterloo. And um, uh, it, I say it was the most difficult chapter to write and, uh, and I'm told a difficult chapter to read. So I don't apologise for that because I think we should know what happens to women who were not there, uh, as sometimes we hear. They were there treating it like a sort of holiday. Everybody knew that there was likely to be violence and they came uh, to Peterloo marching in columns with the men, with the male reform societies with flags and their caps of liberty. So they, they were there as agents in their own rights. And that's one of the reasons why they were particularly attacked by the troops, because they were a thing out of place. They were women out of place. There was a big scramble in the media to report this because they all knew that something was going to happen. The Times actually sent a journalist up from London. So rather than wait and nick it from a regional paper, which is what they normally did, um, they sent, it took him 36 hours to get here, and then he and uh, another journalist literally had a race back to London to see who could get, get the um, story out first. One of the first accounts of it, backwards, um, was from Edward Baines Jr., who was sent by his father from Leeds to see what was going on, and he was only 19, and he was horrified. Um, as you can see from from the um, uh, from his account, the woman with the flags is Mary Files, who was on the the platform, who literally was hanging from the platform while a cavalry man slashed her over the table. Um, and the late Mercury republished one of the first accounts of what has happened at Peterloo, and there was unsurprisingly absolute outrage. Lots of public meetings, lots of protest meetings. Um, people, it, it was not that Peterloo happened and then people stopped doing this. They came out in even greater numbers. So the protest meeting on Hunslet Moor in September, um, uh, a few, uh, about three weeks, three to four weeks later, had between 30 and 40,000 people at it. Uh, um, the um, there was by then a female reform society in Leeds, 
and there is an account of uh, standards. Standards were all placed on the hustings, and several women who were at the head of their respective bodies of female reformers mounted the stage with their flags in their hands. Several of the younger females were habited in white with green ribbons around the wrists and bunches of black crepes. The matrons were mostly dressed in deep mourning. Um, the, uh, one of the women from the Leeds Society called Isabella Blackburn presented the, um, uh, the Cap of Liberty to the chair and gave him an address to read out on the women's behalf. It is not because they couldn't speak for themselves, but because women do not have voices that carry as far, certainly untrained women's voices, do not carry as far as the men who were accustomed to public speaking. So generally speaking, they would ask a man to read it out while the woman stood next to them. We can do it now, but you can see the logic then when there was no, um, and uh, you know, no microphones. And then the, um, and then at the end of that, Somebody appeared and said, oh, the cavalry's coming, the cavalry's coming, and there were some, several minutes of chaos, and then they all sorted themselves out and settled down. And the Mercury was very complimentary about the Chief Magistrate of Leeds, because the Chief Magistrate of Leeds apparently took the view that what the Magistrates of Magistrate had done was illegal, and he wasn't going to do it here. So, um, you know, in a way, we were lucky. There were there were some disturbances at Sheffield. There were disturbances in other places, but we got away with it peacefully. The leaders of the uh, reform movement were, of course, all arrested. They were tried at York. They were not tried for capital offences because the government didn't want the spectacle of hanging Henry Hunt, um, and so they tried them for um, non-capital offences, and they were all locked up for several years, and and that. You know, cut the head off the reform movement. And in the early 1820s, the economy started to recover. Um, there was more work, so there was more money. Uh, and the reform movement didn't go into complete abeyance, but, but went quiet, as movements do. Movements that take a long time to achieve their objectives will have periods of frenetic activities and then periods of quiet. Which brings us 13 years later. Seems a lot further away, but actually it's only 13 years between Peterloo and the Great Reform Bill. Um, in the 1820s, there was a good deal of constitutional change. So the 18, uh, in 1828, uh, dissenters were, had their civil limitations lifted, so they could now vote, they could go to universities, yeah, they could uh, have government jobs. Um, so that resolved that problem, which had been running for more than 150 years. And crucially, in 1829, Catholic emancipation happened. And that meant that it then became inevitable that there would be some kind of reform in England and Wales because Ireland now had a more democratic political system than this country did. And people generally felt that was not on. However, by this point, i.e. the point at which it looked as though it was going to succeed, the middle classes took over the reform movement. And crucially, the mill owners took over the reform movement, the employers took over the reform movement um, because they did not have votes and they um, wanted them. And so what the reform bill became is not what it was originally um, envisaged as. Um, and as a consequence, the reform movement split and Henry Hunt and the old reformers from 1819 largely opposed the reform bill because it did not enfranchise the working class and it wasn't universal suffrage as they defined it. So the bill imposed, imposed it didn't specify the mill owners, it said a £10 property um, uh, threshold, but uh, most working class people were not going to meet that as a threshold 
uh, when it had been two pounds. So there were people who were disenfranchised by the bill. The uh, promoters of it said that what would happen is that all these nice liberal um, mill owners, of which so many who voted Whig and were, you know, opposed to Tories and so on and so forth, would get in and then pass legislation which would improve life for working people. And it will surprise nobody to learn that this is not what happened and that the working classes were so disappointed with the consequence of that, that uh, in particular the new poor law of 1834 was one of the drivers for the foundation of the Chartist movement. And the bill specifically excluded women from the franchise. Um, uh, in Leeds, this woman lost all her votes. Um, this is uh, what well, she would have done. Uh, she would have done had she still been alive. To be fair. Um, this is Frances A. D. Owen, who owns Templeism and is was responsible for the gardens and uh, some of the improvements to the building. She also owned property in Horsham in Surrey or Sussex, I always forget which, I'm sure somebody's Sussex, did somebody say something? Thank you. Um, I, 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 don't, I always get confused, I know I ought to know. Um, and she had had a whole bidding war with the Duke of Norfolk for the Burgage plots in Horsham. And she uh, simply outbid him all the time. He spent £70,000 trying to defeat her and he couldn't do it because she always got there first. Between them, they drove the price of property in Horsham up so far that it cost more to buy a house in Horsham than it did in central London. Um, and in the end, he could not get control of it until after she was dead and her daughter had inherited uh, all her votes. And then he paid her daughter over 91,000 to buy them from her. So it cost him something over 160,000 to get control of those votes. Now, obviously, this is a system that we, we can't object to seeing gone, but what went with it was Lady Irwin's right to vote. And she could have exercised it in person. Most vote owners chose not to, you know, including men, they sent stewards or whatever or whatever. Um, uh, another woman who also lost her votes, of course, is Anne Lister at Shipton, uh, who um, was also opposed to the bill, but for different reasons from the movement. Uh, there were lots of demonstrations, and um, this picture, courtesy of Central Library. Um, this is a pro bill demonstration. You can see it said the bill, the whole bill, nothing but the bill, which was a slogan of pro bill demonstration. It is also a demonstration against Queen Adelaide, um, within the fourth queen, who was reputed to be the moving force behind. Um, aristocratic opposition to the bill, in particular behind the King's refusal to um, sign uh, various versions of the bill. There was political chaos nationally, there were governments um, rising and falling. Um, the uh, uh, Duke of Wellington at one point tried to form a government um, and couldn't get anybody to sit in the cabinet, and the Times said, uh, you know, they pitied anybody in politics. Um, being approached by him because the first qualification for anybody going into the cabinet was to abandon his good name and reputation. Um, so it, it was a it was time of complete uh, chaos. The effigy there, which was often burnt at these demonstrations, is of Queen Adelaide. Um, no petticoat government, and uh, you can't quite see it because it's under the um, transcript thing, but. Um, uh, that, that banner says uh, uh, three boos for the Queen, three groans for the Queen. Uh, this is the cloth hall in Leeds. You will see there are no, men, no women on the platform because women were not directly involved in the organisation of this campaign. There is a woman or a man in drag in the axe in the audience to remind the royal family that what we have done once, we can do it again. People actually wrote to the papers and said 
Um, and there are few women in the in the audience. There, of course, women were interested and engaged, but they were not engaged in on the public stage in quite the same way. Um, however, the bill was a juggernaut, and through it went. Um, and uh, in the dog days of the 1832 Parliament, Henry Hunt presented a petition from a woman called Mary Smith, a woman of wealth from Stanmore in Yorkshire, asking for the vote. And this is always quoted as the first petition from an individual woman asking for the vote. But nobody ever gives us the text of the petition. So it was locked down when I was writing this book. I had nothing better to do. I found the text of the petition. And I have to say, it wasn't quite what I expected. It finishes like this. Does a man who maintain opinions of such monstrous absurdity and cruel injustice, i.e. not to want women to vote and sit on juries, are the notorious and avowed worshippers of the bones and doctrines of Thomas Paine, our reputation nearly as infamous as their own, are consequently peculiarly prone to those execrable propensities which are cursed with a malignant hostility to the female and which are a nature so horrible that the indulgence of them, when detected, drives their wives to cut their own throats. <laughs> what is this about? What is she on about? Why is she so angry? Which clearly she was. I mean, the rest of it is in much this vein. Um, why was she so angry about it? Um, but also, why does this come up after the Reform Act has gone through? Why not send it in while the Act was going through Parliament and there was some chance of amending it so that women retained their votes, if that's what she was actually concerned about? Why give it to Henry Hunt, who had, you know, had no objection to women voting, but had never done anything to promote it either? Um, so um, I started uh, looking for her, and the uh, outcome of that looking is in the is in the book. But it is basically not at all what you might think. Um, one thing that I found was that um, the the newspapers were absolutely terrified of the petition. So initially, the Evening Standard printed it and lots of regional papers picked it up and printed it. And then they all started apologizing for printing it. Some of them printed it with the end left off. Um, some of them printed it with chunks in the middle left out. The Times was so terrified by it, but it didn't print it at all, but still apologised for it. Mm -hmm. So you then thought, well, this has got to be a bit more than just men being outraged by women asking for the vote, when you think of all the things that have, have gone before. Um, and uh, in fact, the clues are in the text, and I missed them all because I was so busy looking for Stanmore in Yorkshire. There is no Stanmore in Yorkshire. It's one of the things I discovered. Um, uh, so I suspect that she wasn't called Mary Smith and that she didn't come from Yorkshire, but I have no evidence for that whatsoever. It's a, um, a suspicion. In fact, it is to do with this man. Um, because I came across this in the Westmoreland Gazette, thank goodness for digitised newspapers. Uh, Mrs. Smith informed, Mrs. Smith informs us, so somebody's spoken to somebody that the concluding observations have reference exclusively to some arguments of use by Mr. Cobbett against the rights for which he was a citizen to end. We are having very sorry to oblige Mr. Cobbett. William Cobbett was one of the most famous radicals and reformers of the time. He was a strong advocate um, for the working classes. He had some quite odd ideas, but he also had some um, uh, a, a real reach and uh, uh, published one of the first um, really popular uh, newspapers amongst working class people. One of the things he was famous for was going to America and fetching back the bones of Tom Paine. Slightly like less famous for losing them, which is why there is no grave anywhere in this country. But that, that's why the reference to, to Thomas Paine is in there. 
And the explanation for uh, all of that throat cutting and horrendous stuff is that William Cobbett had been caught, allegedly, in a compromising position with his male secretary by his wife. And his wife had attempted suicide. And they, they had then separated. And in 1830, his three sons had been prosecuted for assaulting somebody who had repeated this story. And they were acquitted on the grounds that there had been intolerable provocation, which could not be repeated, and the nature of which could not be repeated in open court. And so once you know that, the language of the petition become, and, and all the things she says about women should be sitting on juries, because if women were sitting on juries, um, uh, judgments would be different and um, uh, that, that women are told that they will be protected by their husbands when, as the courts tell us, their husbands are the very people from whom they need protection. It all suddenly falls into place. And so I think that Mary Smith, sadly, not of Stanmore in Yorkshire, possibly of Stanmore in Middlesex, almost certainly not called Mary Smith, um, uh, it knew exactly what she was doing when she gave it to Henry Hunt. She was getting all this stuff into the public domain at no risk to the person who put it there because Henry Hunt, who didn't like Hobbit very much because this whole era is big egos clashing up against each other. Um, he could say what he liked under parliamentary privilege and he was on his way out anyway. And so I think that we should, I think somebody should do a proper research project on all of that and find out, see if we can't track her down, see if that is true, because my interpretation might be completely wrong. That's just um, the conclusion to which I have come. Um, but I would really like to know, because I think simply referencing very subject, suffrage histories without referencing what she went through is, um, is a shame, and we lose something from that. Because we tend to think of her as some little spinster lady somewhere writing a petition. Not like that at all. The last woman nobody has heard of. In the course of looking for uh, Mary Smith in or around Leeds, we've had a wild hope we might find her somewhere here and we could put up a blue plaque and, you know, claim her as our own. So we can't do that. However, I looked at all the variations of Mary. Mary Ann, Mariah, there's a Mariah Smith who lived on Otley Road. I don't think it was her because um, she lived, she was a, a, not a woman of wealth, very clearly. Um, and another one I came across was Mary Ann Smith. So Mary Ann Smith is born in Rawdon in 1809. She was apprenticed to a shopkeeper. When she finished her apprenticeships, she and her sister and her cousin, her cousin is Grace Thompson, who is uh, 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 yeah, list somewhere, um, bought a confectionery business and set up shop. Uh, her sister left the business when she married, uh, which left um, Mary Ann and Grace running a confectionery shop at 17 Brigand. And I thought, oh, that's interesting, you know, women running a business. And so I uh, rolled around in trade directories because of that state of lockdown, there wasn't much else to do. Over half of the 35 confectioners in Leeds in the 1830s were women owning and running businesses. And that's just in you know, what we would now think of as the centre. Um, and Mary Ann's was particularly successful. She'd been employing quite a number of, of staff. When the railways appeared, she thought, I'll have some of that. And she bought some railway stock, which was probably a very good investment. And when she died in 1855, she died not a wealthy woman, but comfortably off with plenty to leave to her um, nephews and nieces. And I like this story because it's, it runs counter to all the other women in the book. She probably, she was Quaker, so she probably did support the sugar boycott, the slave grown sugar boycott. The um, anti slavery society used to give confectioners a little card to put in their window that says, We don't use slave grown sugar, so that their um, 
uh, so people could make an informed and ethical choice about their buying. Um, which is a practice we all recognise, and which she, perhaps, I think, started with the anti slavery Society. But I imagine that she did do that, and I like to think of her in her shop at the bottom end of Brigitte, selling cakes, and it, it, nobody baked celebration things in those days. You went to a confectioner's and you bought one of these really elaborate sugar creations for your centrepiece for your table, and those are the things that she made together with sweets and all the rest of it. And so I like to think of Mary Ann Smith, who you find by chance, just working away and having a life, employing other people in a women-only business. She had by this point got her father uh, living with her. Um, this is the 1851 century Express starting with I've got her father living with her. And, um, but otherwise, it's an entirely female household. The household next door is a female household of a, a shoe shop. Um, and uh, Thompson and Smith, the confectionery company, concerned, endured until the end of the 19th um, century. So she was in Leeds when all the stuff I've been talking about happened. She must have seen the monster. Uh, uh, meeting as it processed down Bridget and out to Hunstead Moor. They must have gone past the front of her shop. And we know something about them, but we know nothing about all the Mary Anns just living life and watching these things go by and hoping to survive them. So she isn't in the book, but somebody should write a book about the Mary Ann Smiths of history. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nam, for that most interesting talk. Uh, there is a little bit of time for questions, and while you are thinking about what questions to ask now, there is one comment on chat that has on to you. Oh, yes. Yes, that Stanmore might be the misprint for Stainmore, which is quite a common Yorkshire place yes. name. Uh, there is indeed, in what is now whatever Westmoreland has become, Cumbria, a Stainmore right on the border with Yorkshire and which used to be in Yorkshire. And given that it's the Westmoreland Gazette who said that they had spoken to her, my suspicion is that that is the same more concern. I have no proof of it. I could not find a Mary Smith in Stainmore, but again, it would require, I think, somebody who's able to, to look at local history archives in that area to see if they can turn up because that might not have been the name. I'm fairly certain it wasn't, but so yes, I agree. Question. So can I just turn the microphone around? Otherwise people on Zoom won't be able to hear what you're saying. You said that there were lots you you limited it to that period because there were lots more later. Did you know of any earlier women than oh, yeah. starting Yes. yes. Oddly enough, women have been interested in politics for as long as politics have been happening because, the, it, because it directly affects them. And so there have always been political women and there have been women who became political. The, the, um, uh, the French Revolution was an enormously political, politicizing and energizing event. And so there are women, and there are a couple of them in the book who um, went from, you know, being quite nice, liberal type women living in London before it, who then suddenly became intensely political when the revolution happened. And there were events, that, you know, there is no event in our history where you can't find women involved. Sometimes it is only as wives and mothers and sisters and daughters, but often it is on their own account, um, particularly with women who, whose marriages included contracts about property, because those women were likely to have a degree of independence about what they said and did. But there were always women leading food riots as far back. As you want to go, because food riots until 
post supply was still the earth in the mid 19th century in the sense that we became less subject to famine uh, and plenty and the, the, the bumps were evened out more and import became more food preservation became easier so the, the, the well, narrative about food changes in the middle of the 19th century but prior to that as soon as prices went up uh, women came women were organizing themselves into benefit societies and trade unions what we would now call trade unions it, it, early in the the 18th um, century women were involved in uh, all the events of the 17th century particularly the mid 17th century in all kinds of ways and there are lots of people doing some excellent work digging these women out there are some really good books around now about um about women in, in previous times and um the only thing that i say about them, i speak as one just this myself is that we have a tendency to want to fit all these women into heroic molds and uh women are not all heroic any more than men are all heroic and uh, I, I think when we've got over the excitement of suddenly unearthing all these women, we need to stand back a little and let them breathe. Do you have any you wouldn't have been doing rights if you were a middle class woman. You, but you, you might very well have joined the anti slavery society or one of the um, missionary societies that there were of varying degrees of quality. If you were working class, um, if you were working class, you would have been brought up, and so would your uh, husband, in an environment where it was a given that women's responsibility for feeding their children meant that when food became unavailable, it was your job to go out and get it. And um, so they would not have been surprised. There's, there's, no, no, no. There was, there were raised eyebrows about the female reform society because they were so new, it was such a, you know, what do you mean they're organising themselves? What do you mean they don't mean that the Stockport uh, Reform Society, uh, their first meeting, men turned up to it and they passed a resolution asking the men to leave yeah. um, and, uh, and explained to them it wasn't because they didn't like them, but just because they wanted to be all women. And the men said, oh, all right then. And then the women said, yeah, but just leave the bottles because it was quite obvious thing. Um, so yeah, there, there was a there was a, an interest in this thing. Well, this is new, isn't it? And certainly, people who will not have approved of it. But generally speaking, the disapproval was class based rather than than gender based within a class. So, so you mentioned that, and the children passed. I think the voting, I think women owning and using votes was associated with corruption. And um, so all the women, well, there were women who just owned one vote, who owned one property and one vote. and. Then obviously when that woman married, that passed automatically to her husband uh, on the day of marriage. So she automatically lost her vote. And, but I think generally when it comes to women like Frances Irwin and um, as far as Elizabeth Lawrence and, and Anne Lister, the general view was that, that they were part of a deeply corrupt system. And that therefore women voting was part of the corrupt women only votes was part of the corruption. And so they, they just changed it and that men were honorable and decent enough to go out to the women. Mm -hmm. and, and also I think some of them they just didn't think. I think they just thought it perfectly reasonable given the language of the time. If you say a voter will be a man, mm -hmm. 
over the age of 21 who owns or rents a property of £10 or more in value. Well, what's wrong with that? However, it did make the suffrage movement inevitable. Yes, fourteen ten, yeah. Yeah, it, it is probably by four but the five roses too. And that that that's that's a, that responsibility for feeding people is a thread that runs all through, and it's and it still exists in society now. Uh, I mean, uh, there are changes and generational changes going on, but we, you know, when companies are thinking about who they're advertising their food products to, they are heavily advertising them to women because we still have that millennia old. Thing built into us of it is it is our duty to feed our children, and and men's duty to provide the wherewithal to do that. Before, when you had times of high unemployment and men were not earning anything, what were women going to do? Do you have any other questions or comments? If not, can I thank them for this interesting, wide-ranging, uh, and entertaining talk? We're very pleased that you've indicated to us there's still a lot more to be found out. <laughs> so we're all looking forward very much to your next book. <laughs> Traditional insight and present our speakers with a small token of appreciation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.